Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, we're not live at the moment, are we? Right, if I could actually um, let people know that we are about to start the meeting. Yeah. So, um, and it is an open meeting, and we will be recording this session. Take it, everybody's happy with that. Yeah. And it's live streamed. Okay. <coughs> so, if everybody's happy, we. Um, got a hybrid meeting, so if I could welcome everybody to the Education Commission Equality Committee meeting, um, open meeting, and um, I'm going to start with welcome and introductions. I'm going to ask everybody to actually do a brief introduction very quickly because we'd like to welcome Sarah Griffiths, who is the new governance manager, Sarah, so you might not know people around the table or on screen, so I know some of us have said hello to you ahead of the meeting, but um, we'll start with that. So, um, and for the purposes of the minutes, then you'll know when people ask some questions, how you've met them, albeit briefly. So, I'll start. I'm Tina Domley, and I'm an independent member of the board. And my sins, I'm the chair of um, ECQC, having taken over. This position of April this year from um, Ruth Ford, who was previous chair and is now vice chair of the board. So, very well. Hi, uh, David Baird, board secretary. Uh, Mushu Mangat, medical director of health education. John Gladman, independent board member. This is Riley, deputy director, education commission on quality, health education for the Ruth I'm an independent board member. I'm um, vice chair because you're done. I'm a special interest uh, rural in, um, issues or topics uh, and research. Jill Lewis, independent member board and um, chair of the Audit and Insurance Committee on this committee as well. So I'm the Director of Nurse and Health Professional Education here at Health Education Network Wales. Lovely to meet you. Okay, we can go to people on the screen now. Rhiannon, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks Tina. Hi, I'm Rhiannon Beckett. I'm the Interim Director of Finance, Planning and Performance. Thank you. Fiona and Kenneth Lane and Shona. Okay, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Sarah Griffiths, I'm the Governance Manager. So, I'm new with board started on Monday. So, it's nice to meet you all. Shona, do you want to say hello if you're ready to say hello? Hello, I'm Shona Umrod, I'm Project Officer of the Education Commission in the Women's School Market today. Great to see you. Right, so having got the introductions um, undertaken, we're now going to go through apologies. I know we've had apologies from Kirsty Moon, the dental dean, and Margaret Allen also. Yeah, Mar Margaret's on the lead. All right. Uh, and Kirsty was due to be here, but unfortunately, uh, she's had to go to a different meeting, which her deputy couldn't go to because he had a briefing to his family. So, absolutely. I'm not aware of any other apologies for absent you. No. This is okay. Um, next on the agenda is the Declaration of Interest. Now, there's a number of items on the agenda which do, do involve um, universities, so I'm aware that people have declared interest, but if you could, for the, um, today's minutes, um, identify any links you have to the university specifically in relation to um, 3.1 on the agenda item. I'll start by saying that I am a fellow of the University of South Wales. Any other declaration? Sure, if I may. So there's um, item 2.1.2, uh, 
Um, there's reference there to as with the Swansea University, so I will not take part in that end of the discussion. And also, paper 4.1 uh, from the autumn student cohort, and again, reference to Swansea University, there, so I won't take part in that also. The other main students is just to say that I'm the chair of the advisory board to the Welsh Centre for Public Policy and Issues at Cornwall University. So uh, I am only titled at Swansea declarations of interest. Can I now move on to item 1.4, the draft minutes of the um, ECQC meeting held on the 6th of November, so, sorry, December for accuracy. So if we go to page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, Page six and page seven. Okay, so we can accept those as an accurate record. Um, thank you. And um, if we could now go to the action log. There was one item on the action log to move the questions relating to committee subgroups and self assessment questionnaire. And I understand that's been completed. That's correct. Okay, so um, if I can now go back to the minutes and I'll take any matters of rising. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six. Page seven. So there's no matters arising. So having completed the preliminary matters, we now move on to part two, education performance and quality, and looking at item 2.1, multi-professional education and training quality assurance updates. And um, we're going to hear from you, Push, and then also from Ulysse. So Push, over. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ed. Uh, well, I'm going to assume that the paper has been read uh, by a number I'd like to just highlight a couple of things. One is that this is a new um, uh, way of reporting. We've we've not just um, put in things that you're used to about the areas of bringing in house monitoring, but also the areas that are sort of bubbling under that level uh, as red risks, which includes um, uh, some of the, you know, where, where all health boards are in their position uh, in, in our quality framework and how we are managing that. The, um, the additional parts of, um, of, of this uh, paper also include um, some of the uh, actions we're taking uh, in recruitment, particularly in, and we've used radiology and vascular surgery as examples here, and the risks that we're taking in relation to those um, uh, posts, which are Particularly related to the six month grace period, which is something that we are obliged to provide to any trainee who wishes to take it. Um, the, the, there's also a little uh, section on uh, how foundation training is managed 
both nationally and our share of that in Wales. Um, at the time of writing this, um, this paper, we had a, 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 a risk of having to find extra posts. I can actually say that that risk has disappeared already due to um, attrition that has uh, occurred uh, across the UK and, and here in Wales. So um, whilst we were concerned about the oversubscription of the foundation programme, we no longer are going to be worried about oversubscription. If anything, we might be having more concerns about uh, not filling the posts. And the, there's another section on uh, how we are managing the increased um, propensity for trainees to uh, request less than full-time training. What we're now doing, we're trying to appoint full-time equivalent posts. So three people into two posts, for example, um, or two people who are doing 0.6 of a whole-time equivalent into one post, but funding the extra bits. So all in all, uh, that's something we continuously manage, but it's becoming an increasing issue because of the increased desire for trainees to be less than full-time. Um, the areas of enhanced monitoring are similar to before. Um, the one that has, has caused us most concern uh, is trauma orthopedic, uh, trauma orthopedic surgery in Morriston. Um, you may recall that uh, the GMC joined our visit last summer, uh, last March, um, with the possible outcome that, of withdrawing trainees. That hasn't happened, and things we believe uh, uh, have been pulled back from that position, but we are getting regular uh, updates on, on uh, that particular unit. The good thing I can, um, the feedback I can provide is that they are shortly due to open uh, an elective surgery site in the Port Talbot, which we believe will offer training opportunities for those uh, trainees that they haven't been getting and will rectify largely that situation. So, but we haven't put it in the paper yet because that's actually happened. Um, so the recommendations in the paper are that uh, note the overall paper and the current risks and the exceptions in relation to postgraduate medical training. Um, note the issue about six month grace periods and how that's affecting our recruitment and how we are managing that. The foundation training post issue and the vacancies caused created by part time working, how we're approaching that. I can comment, I can add that there's two appendices about pharmacy and dental professionals. We have no, uh, no areas of risk or concern in either of those uh, two professional areas. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Right, take John and then Rosie. Yeah. Um, I've got a few um, questions, actually. Um, they're probably um, the back. Question, but bear with me. So, um, <clears throat> in terms of the foundation posts, I was going to ask about placements and the infrastructure, for, you know, for greater than the number, but obviously, you say that's changed, and that is alarming because that's a huge attrition since the paper was written. So, I'm, I'm more concerned about that now um, in terms of attrition again. Um, so, that's the first question. The second just relates to the quality bit and how we decide on visits and our risk matrix. And I, I probably um, have seen that um, at some point, but can't quite recall how we decide where we go, when we go to look at the quality. Um, but I'm, I, I think I've raised this before. The, the units that have been in special measures have been in an awful long time. And, and I said this at the last committee, I think, I, I know you said that there's an action plan and, and times, but it, it feels to me um, as if we've been seeing the same units repeatedly in special measures. And I, I just want to know when that's going to turn around, because it, it feels like um, sure. um, you know, we're always accepting it, and I know we're not. Um, so if I deal with the foundation issue first, yeah. that has actually been an annual issue for several years. 
um, every year we we if we we part of national training across the UK uh, can be proved. So what happens is that um, there's there's a ruling in the foundation program which is now being discussed at the national level that anyone who applies for a foundation post is guaranteed one. And since um, the visa rules for overseas graduates has changed, we've been having increasing numbers of applicants every year from overseas largely. Uh, so that in the past when we weren't filling all of our foundation posts, we are now filling them all. But because of the over recruitment rule, we have been uh, asked to take our share in Wales according to the bar department of the oversubscription. So it's that oversubscription that we haven't had to um, that we, we haven't had to deal with. And each year, year on year actually, we um, uh, we always uh, make plans for an oversubscription and last three years we haven't had to actually implement it. So this is coming to you for the first time. But it's part of almost business as usual for us in managing the, the foundation program. What we've noticed this time on the attrition point of view is that um, for a variety of reasons, particularly the overseas applicants, they change their minds, they don't want to come, um, having applied. Uh, and within uh, the UK, many people decided to have a gap year before they do the foundation year, or they may have done decided that um, or, or not pass their exams. So but due to multiple reasons, which may be personal, maybe educational, or maybe international travel, uh, etc. Uh, the requirement has not actually tra uh, transpired that we, we need to go to the extra the extra lot, which would be 30. I'd say we go at risk of those 30. We back down now to just taking our normal uh, intake. Um, and I think we'll be round, round about the mark that we always are uh, about recruitment. There's always some last minute changes that we have to manage. So I'm, I'm a bit more worried about attrition that might happen than normal, but I don't think it's, it's something that I'm going to really lose sleep on. So is that okay? Yeah. The foundation. So the visits. So the visits are uh, <coughs> the visits are triggered by three main factors. One is the GMC trainer survey. Second is the GMC trainee survey. Third is any inspection that's done by an external body, which might be health inspector Wales. It might be audit. It might be. Um, one of the colleges, for example, vascular surgery in North Wales. <clears throat> so all of these and other, that's not exclusive to them, but any information we get where it's a training issue, that is one of the triggers for us to go and do a visit. The main ones are the trainers, trainer and trainee surveys. Generally, we get good feedback from most of our training units, the majority of our training units out, out of, out, uh, in, within Wales. And the surveys usually show that we are the, the best deanery in, in uh, medical deanery in the UK for trainee satisfaction. So that's a good thing, but we're not going to rest on any laurels. Um, the way we then look at them is see what information is coming to us from all these sources. We then go and visit to see, okay, do they, are they aware of them? Are they managing them? Or are they not paying much attention to them. And based on lots of information that comes back from the visit, um, which includes trainees, includes the health board, includes trainers, based on the information we get back, we decide on their risk rate. So anywhere, anyone who's got a red risk from that process, we will go to visit. So all those things that you see on the red, red list are places which are on the visit list. And at that point, we decide whether it needs to be enhanced with the GFC to put them into, as you say, um, enhanced monitoring. The reason for that is to make sure that uh, we have a process around it, because the only next step is to withdraw training. And the reason that we keep them within enhanced monitoring for a long period of time 
is because many of the changes that need to be made are structural. It might be uh, appointment of consultants, which has time on the scales. It might be building reconfiguration. Sorry, that's one of the things that will be automatically put people into, re into enhanced monitoring. There's a major reconfiguration. Um, and um, so all of those things can take time, which is one of the reasons that these things can go on over a period of time. That's not unusual. That's the length of time it takes across the UK for many of people to come out of enhanced monitoring. Once we are satisfied, there are many places which are in enhanced monitoring now that if we were to just do a visit now, we wouldn't put them in. But once you're in, you have to satisfy lots of criteria to get out of it. And I think that's what the GMC demand of the places because they want sustainability. So that's the background to it. Well, I, hope, I hope that helps. All right, that's, that's all really helpful. Um, I just have a couple of points. So, um, uh, one I just noted the less than full time working and education. It seems to me that this is going to be a, a, a growing trend that is going to be across, um, across professions. And so, I'm quite really clear that you know, started an approach to managing that, but it will mean in time. Um, quite proactive management and make quite difficult to predict. So I don't know how you get ahead of the game, but it's just, it's just to sort of note that there's a problem potentially ahead. Um, the second is a, is a detail. And I noticed from the dental report that there were, from the dental, yeah. I asked about that, yeah, that there were a number of third time failures in the registration assessment process. So I just wonder what happened to people who failed three times. Do they then get um, some of them? The foundation. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. This is, um, yeah. you know, okay. I wonder, uh, are they, some of them may be totally unsuited, yeah. and some of them may have a, a value after the training that they've already so, received. So I think so, the less than four time issue first. We've been aware of less sort than of full-time issues for the last couple of years. So a couple of years, I think we were, years ago, I think we were caught on the hop in the way that you're describing with and, and the problem, yeah. the problem is is that people get their post yeah. and then ask for less than full time. If we knew right up front that they wanted less than full time, it'd be easy to manage. So what we've been doing in several of the areas where this is really prevalent is over recruiting and then managing uh, the best we can mm. for our services. Our services like it because if they have three people doing two whole-time equivalents, which is often the way, we end up with, um, with them having three people on a rotor instead of two, which actually helps their rotors. So in a sense, <laughs> there's benefits in that. But you're absolutely right, we, we have to my tendency is to over recruit and if we have to pay more we accept that because ultimately i'd rather have more people in training we more like to keep them in training more like to have them in Wales long term if, if, if that happens so yes you're right that um we should keep an eye on it now that we will and we'll, we'll, we'll pass the, pass that principle that we're doing in pediatrics where it all start into the other areas where it's happening it's happening but also it has implications for costing mm -hmm. Um, and for times and you know in, in a whole range of, of impacts and so I'm just interested in this topic. Okay. As for the foundation dentists, so dent amongst the four professions in my area, um, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and um, optometry, dentistry uh, is the one which stands out as being very different in that. Once you get qualified to uh, finish your undergraduate course, you're not obliged to do the foundation. It's not an obligation. You can go straight into private practice. You can do actually whatever you like. And that results in us having difficulty mandating. So what, what we're finding, because people don't have to do foundation, our vacancies are being utilized by many people who've done their dental, dental training abroad. Now, what I know, we found, is that the experience that dentists, uh, dental 
undergrad students get abroad is very difficult to get here. They actually come out of training in the UK, being able to do extractions, fillings, and various complex, um, even more complex work. When these, uh, when they qualify as dentists in other parts of Europe, particularly where we got experience, they don't have any of that. So they're coming here to do the foundation year with no proof of, of, of handle, handling skills uh, at all. So we're teaching people from scratch. And quite frankly, some of them aren't up to it. And as a result, we, uh, we've got a duty to the regulator here not to allow people to get qualifications of, or, or approval of, um, of, of a pet part of training that they haven't reached the standards of and we do our best for them we, which is why they end up with extensions and the extra attempts but at some point we have to say enough is enough and that's that's where we've reached but that i think is part and parcel of the increasing volume of um, international uh, students looking for foundation programs that's really interesting but it would be a confusing to see any skills that they didn't have given that there's a range of about that many um, different opportunities within the dentistry to make a contribution. So in terms of us moving to... I'm not sure what we could get those to. Is there anybody else? Okay, that's fine. I, mean, <laughs> I, I appreciate well, that. I'm just... um, one thing in the dental thing, that, that, that an update I should have mentioned, is that on Monday we launched um, Careersville and Train Work Live for Dental Services. Um, uh, and one of the things that we've done there is, is um, an enhanced recruitment offer, or it's called the Wales Enhanced Recruitment Offer, we are at for sure, um, which uh, has departed from the national recruitment process for foundation for the first time. We're the first country to do this. We're actually looking at local recruitment, largely from Cardiff graduates, but it's open to anybody who wants to come work in Wales. You know, somebody who's from Wales has got their dental degree elsewhere but wants to come back. We're offering uh, these, these uh, individuals, we, we decided to go for five or six, but we had such a good response, we've got 12. That's 12 people who are going to go to the hardest to recruit areas in West Wales and Mid Wales. Uh, and they'll have assistance with that place, but they'll have extra training and extra finances for their uh, next exams. So, a package similar to what we've done previously for psychiatry and general practice is now available in, in dental foundation with the aim of having people stay here long term. Okay, thanks. John, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm um, sure. In terms of the paper, um, I, I sort of think our section on um, uh, quality monitoring and those that were enhanced for local education providers helpful. I found the structure helpful. I'm not sure that structure is new. So I thought that was new. That was, that was helpful, I have to say. Um, so that's appreciated. And it gives us a snapshot of the position. My question is if we're looking to gain assurance from that, it leaves me quite uneasy. So if you review the, the without going into any of the detail, if my maths is correct, we've got two that are reducing, we've got 11 that are increasing, we've got three that have stayed the same. Now, some of the timelines on that vary. That leaves me quite concerned without getting into the detail, and you may explain the detail. I guess this links in part to what Jill asked right at the start. Once they accept the structure that you've given us is much better, it equally now means, okay, you give us the narrative, and much of them is the narrative around what is the problem. What I don't see is, and I'm not saying we need to see action plans, that's not the purpose of this committee. I, I'm not asking for detail, I, I'll keep myself out of it. But at least we need to see a snapshot of what the problem is and what is being done. And when can I, as an independent member, see some sort of trajectory of improvement in terms of timeline? Because if I just take that, 
level of them are getting worse. You highlighted the worst one. And if you look at the narrative around the Swansea one, you've got medicine blood price, you've got ophthalmology, new HW, psychiatry, they go on. But if we look at the trouble and orthopedic one, it's been there since 2019. There was some improvement with um, clinical supervision that seemed to have resolved from what I've read now. Now there's more problems. I'm just looking at it from a committee perspective about you giving us some assurance about what you're doing is on track, etc. But from what I got here, it leaves me thinking, oh, this doesn't look good. Which so, can I just come in before you answer that? Because I had that question down myself, and there was an element that I wanted to add to that. One is in relation to um, when you have approached the visits to review the risks and review the issues, some organisations have declined that, and yet there doesn't seem to be a regular timeline as to when you would return into those organisations to reassess and see whether the risk has improved or decreased. And that is implicit within the um, document where some organizations, because of work-based pressures, have, have declined further visits and visits have then been put off. So what's not clear is the timeline upon which or the frequency with which they decline those visits and at what point do we then insist and there's one other question which is still linked to that, an area of concern where it was under Prince Charles Hospital. It says the targeted visit was undertaken in Jan 2022 um, and it's a new risk. So what I couldn't pick up from that was that in relation to the GMC National Training Results Survey 2022, <coughs> was that really a visit in January 2023? It's because it seems as though there's a year whereby we've had a problem and no follow-up visits. So I'm wondering if that's a typo, because it's actually listed as a new risk. It's, um, so it's linked with the data we've had, um, and it's linked to John's question, because we're going to ask exactly the same. Yeah, I think that um, it's a fine balance uh, with the health boards. Um, getting meetings in with all the people who need to be there is, is always a challenge. Even, uh, so, I think that um, prioritising that with, with those organisations is, um, is something that we have a constant battle with, I have to say. Um, the, the concerns that are raised and the risks that we put in, in are all based on a snapshot visit as well. Um, if there's any immediate concerns of safety, they're raised immediately with, um, with the uh, the medical director. So, like most visits, if you know, that there will be a full involvement at, at exec level, education uh, director level, and with the staff who are who are there. They're all a bit different. You know, I think about the Rexham one. We were worried about them because of supervision. But it was sort of okay, but it was the fact that they weren't making any progress from a red risk that we put them into between the So that was based on concerns over a period of time. Others, something might have just happened in the last six, six to 12 months, and, and, and emergency medicine in um, Morrison was one of those. It had been a really great place to work, and all of a sudden, um, two people who took the education law quite seriously left. So they went from a really good position to a very poor position. So every place is in a different situation. Um, in relation to the timeline of visits, uh, I think we are constantly getting feedback from the um, faculty that we have in the health boards. We have people up there at the time. And there's constant information coming back to us from the, the, the faculty quality. To let us know if there's, you know, they guide us on the urgency of going back, uh, and, and if there's a problem, then you know they will tell us we can't have this. We're going to have the visit soon, and we have to make sure it happens. So we've got a constant stream of information between us and the, our faculty staff who are in the health board, and that's been present way before HFW 
indicated to me. So that's the process that uh, we've had, and that's the process the GMC have supported us in. Um, so, in a sense, it's um, I'm not sure how, without having other sticks apart from the one, one of removing trainees, we can do any more than we're currently doing. Um, the the risk ratings can also be changed based on what I said earlier about longevity of problem or acute problem. Um, and we're very sensitive about those risks because, as I say, every place is unique. Then one place may say, we're, we're going to have consultants in place because of vacancies in two or three months, in which case we want to see them embedded before we go back. Another place like trauma orthopedics has got a long term problem with structure and reconfiguration. So unless we get anything that's changed to make it worse, we will want to see that embedded. So that's why the timelines of all of them can be really quite long. And that's why um, some of the risks don't change for a while. And the risk going up, you talk about 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, as a proportion of all of our training schemes around Wales, that's probably less than 10% of the total that are in red risk or, or, or in enhanced monitoring. Everything else is ticking along really well, but we just don't show that here because it's um, it's such a big uh, it's a big undertaking full stop. But this is a small proportion of the training. Chair, just um, thank you for um, so it's useful for me to see the perspective of what this is compared to the board. But I'm still left with the position that um, of these, and we've got a duty to these. Um, that, that you've rightly raised, so I agree with the right. But how do, how do I know that when we meet in the next next quarter or every other month is meeting, that we're going to be in exactly the same position with no ability on our part to demonstrate and to hold individuals to account for some change? Because we could have exactly the same conversation in the next meeting. We've had a similar conversation in previous meetings. Um, I, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm not, it's not, I'm not gonna, I'm just thinking, how can we collectively be saying, well, really, we could be having this, this for a number of meetings, and what should we be doing, therefore, to be able to hold individuals and for us collectively to take responsibility that we're not having the same um, conversation, and that way, if nothing else, we see it's some positive trajectory as opposed to level of them, but it'd be just to see how, how long the left have been in increasing. Um, um, but we may be in a worse position. And then if we had to work out for the next meeting, we'll say, well, you knew about it in the last meeting, we'll have to, you know, we're, we're all responsible. Um, I'm not sure how to <laughs> say any more than I've already said, to be honest, because um, this is, this is, uh, this is a, process that's been, as I say, going on for a long, long time that the GMC supports us in. Um, and, and they are satisfied with the way we're managing quality in these areas. As the regulator, they understand that the, the realities of how to do the training in a hard press system, which we've had. Um, so I can report to you what we find, and I can report to you what we, um, what we do. And I can't always answer your questions because there's a lot of detail and action plans underneath this. Um, I'm concerned that I'm getting into the idea of saying, actually, I, uh, every time we have a report, I circulate it all the event of members. So you can see the level of detail that people go into. Or I can send you an example, if you like, to, to, so you know that that's, that's what happens during a visit and how we get uh, a risk rating. Uh, because they're coming through fairly regularly at the moment. Um, so I, yeah, maybe I guess, that would I guess it's there's a shooting that the GFC are looking at this. They're satisfied with the processes that we've got. To, you know, we've got to take some assurance of that. Every every grading that we do is we recommend it to the GFC and they accept it. So they are the ones who have to agree to that. So these are GMC criteria, not ours. We make a recommendation. Um, as I say, 
sometimes, and, and, and this is an aside I mentioned in one of our previous meetings, that um, we, we underwent a, um, a visit on the quality of our, um, we had a visit from the HOW from, to HOW from the GMC to look at how we deliver quality assurance. They went through that and it was a really good outcome that report. Since then, um, they have asked if they can join us and do some joint work on a number of areas, including because they think that we are delivering exactly what they wish and they think that we're a good standard that should be used across the rest of the UK. In addition to that, um, they will step in if they're concerned about an area like they did with trauma orthopedics. They will be with us and they do come with us randomly on many of these meetings. That's part and parcel of what they always do. So I, I'm, I'm as satisfied as I can be that I've got a regulator who keeps us um, honest over all of this. We don't have anything to gain by, by um, reporting something that isn't true. Uh, because it's in our interest, in our trainees' interest, that we have good quality training. So. I think where, and where, where we are, I think this is a new format of um, the presentation paper. So it has opened quite a bit of debate around the format and the type of information we've had. Um, so I'm going to ask what the board would like to see different or whether you accept that and when the book. But before I move into that, there's just one caveat I, I was going to ask in relation to your last statements, is that the GMC is the regulator responsible for the standards of training. And it might be helpful potentially going forward on papers to say that what the GMC position is in those areas okay. of long standing because the assurance that we are requiring is that we're not putting trainees or patients and clients at risk because of the element of training and the assurance that we're seeking is that yes there are huge pressures within the delivery um, mechanisms of training but it is the regulator's responsibility to determine whether or not training should continue ultimately and put classifications on removing training and also on trainers and trainees. And the GMC do hold regular sessions around the UK where they invite people from health boards and from rural colleges to comment on that experience and then they formulate that. So, the, so what would be helpful here if, if the committee are happy is to say it would be useful to know where information has been escalated to the regulator whether they are bordering on enhanced monitoring for intervention or whether or not they are content with the processes that we are instigating at that point in time because that's an external regulatory um, assurance that should be given to us as the commission i feel i, I just wondered whether if I put that on the table, whether people would be content with that going forward, because as we know, the regulators have that accountability and it would give us some assurance that. That'd be very easy. Yeah. Would it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joe. Yeah, just um, sorry, I don't want to overlabor the points and um, haven't started it. Um, but I mean, that, that was a little bit of where I was coming from. So, we, as a, an organization, it's how we defend, I suppose, our own reputation in a way. And um, on the surface, this we could get left holding the baby, couldn't we? We, we look as though um, we, we sort of we got, don't appear to have any levers to pull. Um, I was just mildly concerned when I understand the pressures out there and the meetings, how difficult they are. But we don't seem to have any way of enforcing that and, and, and back into sort of, you know, sort of all this motion away. But how, how, how do, can we get any levers? Well, I feel that we're all floating in the middle. Yeah, I think it depends, it depends on the individual situation. Um, if I give you the example of um, an iron pepper, 
we had we had a lot of concerns following reconfiguration during COVID. And we could have put the whole health board into in-house monitoring for training across all areas. However, we knew that the major issue was general medicine. If we had done that, um, then the risk of putting the whole health board into um, in-house monitoring would have meant getting those that had only just sort of dipped because of reconfiguration and would easily recover, they would have had a long tail as well. So we set up uh, something in between, which GFC agreed with, which was to have uh, regular meetings with a working group from the health board and from us to basically find out the list of specialty areas that were of concern. And the, over a period of uh, 12 months, all were ticked off bar medicine. So at that point, we put medicine across the four sites into enhanced monitoring, but the rest we didn't have to. So I thought that was a pragmatic way of dealing with the short-term stuff that was happening there and the longer-term issue, the structural issue of medical intakes across four sites. Okay, and just to remind people that we're in open session and, and that the areas that you're addressing um, are in the public domain yeah. and were reported were. in other yes. other avenues. So the issue where we're coming from, I think, for, for this meeting is that this is a new format. It has raised, quite rightly so, some questions about assurances on behalf of the committee. And what we're seeking now is to have maybe a, an adaptation of um, the paper to include where the regulator is in relation to those where there is an increased risk um, or deficiency in, in training standards and delivery, and then potentially what is being done about that so we can get some assurance of people content with that going forward. Yes, Jack. Yeah? Can okay. I just really do it? Okay. The format is helpful. Yes. You know, it generates yeah. the debate. So well, as <laughs> you know, and, and that's why I'm saying, you know, this structure, firstly, that this is a good structure. And I, I was pleased to see it. It was helpful. The fact that it raises questions is good. I, I'm agreeing with you, but the issue is that it's raised those questions quite rightly so, because we wouldn't be doing a job if we weren't. But the bottom line around this is that we are also hand in hand with the regulatory requirements and for them to take that accountability in you know, an independent, responsible organisation which does have public protection right at the heart. So we need to have that insurance as part of that regulatory function. People are content for it. I absolutely agree with everything. I think it's a very good way forward. And I just wanted to say this has come um, oceans um, better since we started. So just to thank people for the work done on it because it's come from a zero base into something that's really useful and constructive. One of the things that we haven't had, or I don't think we've had anywhere, is a sort of statement to capture what we're trying to do through in, in this context, you know, sort of the overarching thing. We are as hands in hand with the regulators. Um, we, we, are, we are reflecting continuous monitoring and snapshot things. It's just sort of the general stuff that flies across the top. And um, whilst we all accept that this is the case, it might just be useful to have that, that down. I'm, I'm not going to give you extra work, but oh, it's a line at the front of every paper. I think that would be helpful. It's, it's what's yes. coming out yes. of it, and, and it would give it a, a frame. The other thing I think is there's not a problem with the discussion now is detail. Yeah, how much detail? Well, I think that the summaries on there are brilliant. And, and they allow you to um, pursue uh, where well, there's obviously a question. Um, but uh, but if you want more, um, you can go and get more. I, I, I put in terms of, of, of detail in the paper that comes here, which I don't think differently, uh, but it does give an opportunity to go deeper if there are things that we want to take from that too. Would, would it be helpful if I sent an example of a visit? Maybe include it as a in the public domain. Yeah, in, yeah. yeah. Maybe <coughs> I suggest that since you said separately so that we can see that. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so there was quite a lot of debate on that part of the paper, so thank you for that. And also to take back um, to the team that the committee were impressed with the improvements made to the paper. Um, it did raise some um, significant debate, which you would expect, but actually what we'd quite like going forward is that where there is um, issues and challenges that we'd like to know what the regulatory position is with regards to the regulatory body that and that i mentioned the gmc but that would be for the gdc and yeah. across the board if there were those issues um but um to go back then to the purpose of the report the committee's asked to note um the risks in relation to the recruitment in the six month grace period for radiology and vascular surgery um, the at-risk addition of 30 foundation training posts for national recruitment to manage the oversubscription. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Subject to that. <laughs> Vacancies created by part-time working parental leave, HIW approach to managing paediatrics, obstetrics and oncology, as you said often, and drainage, but, and note the associated consideration of management to financial risk to um, us as a um, organization and um, members are asked to note the specific updates from pharmacy and dental professionals which are provided in the appendices yeah. and um, appendix one march the 23rd dental update members are asked to note the report <coughs> appendix two quality update pharmacy um, ecq ECQC March 23, final members are asked to note the report. And we're going to go over to you all the moment, Lisa. Yes. Uh, so, just with regards to Jill's really good point, with regards to the risk, because the purpose of that <coughs> notification was to record the risk there, so just, just take off. Okay, Chris, thank you very, very much, and for um, uh, staying with us on. And we mentioned earlier that we were expecting medical deans. Yeah, I we haven't know. had him yet. We haven't had apologies. I, I don't know. Do you want to note his apologies? Um, well, we can now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you don't. There's been no show. <laughs> so I think it's just important. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but I think it's important to note um, because we didn't have his um, okay, so right, Lisa. 2.1.2. Over to you. So, thank you, Chair. And what you've got to do is a report on actually the quality developments. Actually, and that's important report here, as well as actually highlighting to you the risks and the exceptions. To you. In, this, in relation to our contracts. Now, as I've said to you previously, and we've introduced to you that um, we've got new pre-registration contracts in place. They started actually last September. And bringing with that, that you obviously we've actually got a framework, which we've actually developed to do with HEIs, which obviously provides us to you with much more enhanced actually detail and information about the quality of the education that you've been delivered. And just to add to that, given that in the previous conversation, what I will say as well is um, actually beneath actually this particular reporting structure within the directorate, obviously we have got, and a number of the uh, papers will relate to this, we have got programme boards actually which um, relate to pre-registration education, post separately to post-registration education, um, we've also got apprenticeships, and also a separate group which you're looking at placements. So underneath this infrastructure, there's quite a, a number of actually boards which I check. Um, and then underneath that, actually further, is actually all the contract monitoring arrangements that we have to with our universities and our education providers. And all that information does actually get um, taken into, into those groups and actually moved accordingly. If I go about this group as well, actually in terms of the other way, we have got a mechanism as well in place now actually, where our chief executive and chairman actually meets actually, with each of the universities independently. And obviously that's an opportunity to escalate some of the concerns that we've got as well. And that has happened and is happening continually. 
So the report that you basically actually describes to you um, the, the new pre-registration programs. And as I said, we've now got a framework in place, which has given us actually more information about actually, the quality of the education that is being delivered. Um, there is actually a paper going out to the closed part of the board about placements, but actually we actually have raised previously in terms of the placement capacity in North Wales, and actually obviously that continues, but actually it's, it's been monitored continually, and there has been arrangements put in place now between Rexham Glendora and Bangor University together with the health board, because this is actually a triangulated process of actually achieving that. Um, and that actually we're quite satisfied that we are going to be able to make sure that those students will have the placements they need. And of course, actually, this is actually impacted upon the fact that the Bangor University actually obviously have got some students continuing, but of course there was a new contract introduced by Rexham actually from September last year. Um, <clears throat> In terms of actually concern about the poor recruitment, actually obviously apart from monitoring actually what's in place within actually universities, it's important that we actually monitor um, the uptake of actually courses at the end, the recruitment courses from actually our sort of secondary students from our workforce actually population in Wales as well. And we have actually identified that there is concern about poor recruitment. This is across the UK, but nevertheless, it's important that we take heed of that. And as you can see, actually, we've actually looked into certain programmes which have not actually sort of managed to recruit appropriately, given the contracts that they've actually um, put in place. But as well as that, actually, there is a separate paper then that you will see of what are we doing about it. And that's the bit actually, that's most important. Um, in terms of recruitment, that is key. And we will let you go into detail about actually, all the initiatives that we take forward there. Um, in terms of actually improvement, do you want, um, the members will recall that we did bring to your attention some time ago the concerns that we had in terms of the quality of the education and support given to students at the University of South Wales in terms of the midwifery programme. I'm really pleased that you to report really that the interventions that we put in place, and that was not only monitoring on a regular basis because we have got that escalation framework, but what we did do as well we actually introduced to more mentoring and coaching from other universities to actually the um, education providers in that university in order to enhance that. Um, I will say that it actually worked really well and actually we received actually real assurance from that coach really that actually obviously they've seen improvements in actually not only the learning but actually how the infrastructure within that education department has really actually been enhanced. Midwifery is now centre stage, whereas previously it wasn't. Um, so that's really good to, to know. And I think we are at the point of actually really actually reducing that escalation considerably. But I have to sort of applaud at the University of South Wales when we raised that with them actually quite quickly. They took that initiative and that improvement plan has been monitored extensively with them. Um, escalation at Bangor University, once again, we have got a paper coming to the closed section there, but we have actually got to highlight to you the escalation of the concerns. And what you can see in the paper is effectively actually the escalation um, process that we've got in place. So this is quite open. Um, this has been agreed at with our universities in terms of how do we undertake that escalation. Um, they're quite clear on it and they know actually what their responsibilities are. And obviously that is one issue that we've escalated to level three, and that is important that we do that as well. So I'm happy to, to take two questions from that because I know um, members will have read it, but hopefully it gives you actually an understanding of actually the initiatives already underway. And I think we're actually seeing much more collaborative work and we've actually got a um, um, an agreement to with universities and with health boards because we actually really rely actually on that triangulation of working because we can't do it without them. And of course, we've got eyes and ears out there continually in our practice educator facilitators who we obviously then oversee and manage as well. And that comes into that placement arena as well. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions for Lisa? Okay, so there are a couple of issues which you've mentioned. 
um, but on the placement uh, challenges, it's it's, uh, it's it's interesting to note that we're still suffering a tale of impact from COVID. Yes. Um, at the same time, as we're getting new projects in place and new demands for, um, and I, I think it's so um, it's particularly encouraging that there's been a, an option for an all Wales an all North Wales. A platform and increasingly, I would just urge that, that North Wales is sort of in this context rather than focusing on Bang University or Brexit or the resources across it um, need to be thought of as a whole. And of course, there's and, one health board. And the one health board. And that does come through, I don't know, first time now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's uh, in the, you know, an accelerated pedal, pedal uh, to, to spread on. Um, and equally, that applies in the other North Wales issue, which is the group for enhancement of shape at Bank University. Mm -hmm. And there are important funding issues, not this context. Um, so, um, very supportive of whatever you're doing, clearly, we're willing to help if there's anything you can do. I can ask, uh, I guess, one question. Um, are, are we in particular, I, I don't I want to answer to be specific because it's referenced to by the organization, so I put that as a cover. Um, are we in particular any assurance from the work that you're doing around the challenges of attrition that's noted in the paper? The challenge is also of placement capacity that's noted in the paper. So when you think from a work and machine perspective, we could be heading into a perfect storm where we've got issues in terms of limited capacity, people are falling out in terms of attrition, we've got poor, sorry, we've got um, issues with regards to fill rates. So again, not put in the detail, but are we satisfied that some of the strategies that have been put in place around placement capacity and attrition will enable us to have a meaningful commissioning process in subsequent years? I think your point is well made, and actually what I did need to do at the Union Pacific paper is give you a lot of that detail. What I have actually sort of agreed to do with it. We're actually looking into attrition in far, far greater detail actually with the universities. And I want to bring actually that to you as a very feature paper to the next DCQC. And um, it's, it's a deep dive that we're looking at, but actually it looks at all the aspects that you've raised previously in terms of the why, the who, the when, and actually also about the, if people are sort of um, falling out of those courses. What opportunities are they being afforded in either to come into the NHS and work at elsewhere, or, and I know sort of teams that you raised it, and I know I didn't did take this back in terms of what accreditation of prior learning they receive. Um, we have had conversations, I'm sure Martin will come in on this. Some people just leave, okay, and we need to capture what that percentage is. What I wanted to do was actually bring the attrition rates actually to the next meeting. So in other words, let's do the look back of, you know, sort of what has happened and what do we learn from and through. Because I'm, um, I think we're all actually are here actually for this, is about, it's the preparation of um, people actually for this type of education as well. Um, and we had a conversation as well in terms of um, the preparation of actually school leavers ready to go into university, ready to go into further education. You know, we're now looking at that pipeline actually even further down the line. And actually what we want to do is learn from this because we don't know what you whether COVID had an impact on that, on actually that individual, their confidence, because we are hearing about actually the interventions that the universities are having to put in place in order not just actually specifically for our courses, but it's more of a pastoral role actually for all actually students going into sort of university. But I'd like to bring Martin in because obviously he will actually add to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, just, just a couple of things really. Firstly, around, around the placements. Um, it, you know, it is a big issue. And as we increase the numbers, that placement capacity needs to be there. We, we've currently got three, three external members of staff on to common with us. 
one around is diagnostic radiography, one around physiotherapy, one around occupational therapy, looking at the current placement circuit, looking at what the health boards are doing, challenging the health boards around, are they making enough placements available, then looking at wider that international best practice of um, how placements are administered and delivered, how students pick up the outcomes. So we're getting all three reports back, which is good. So building that placement infrastructure is becoming a bigger part of our roles. In terms of attrition, I think it's really fair to say that a lot of the universities have really robust mechanisms around failing students, how to identify them, how to support them on the interruption to study, and how to bring them back in. And I think it's fair to say that during, during lockdown, and the real change on how they had to deliver some of their education, some of those practices. I'm not saying they were out the window, but they were superseded by how can we support the general student population? Because all of a sudden, everyone was at risk there. And I think what we're actually, and I think as a result of that, attrition did creep up a little bit. I think what we're seeing now is um, them having more focus on student retention, more focus on supporting students through interruption study back in, and therefore, putting a lot more pastoral care in, as, as Lisa alluded to. So I think they're getting back to some form of enhanced normality around managing students' well-being. But during, I must say that we did see increases in attrition rates during COVID, because I think they were seeing it was such a big adjustment for everyone. And, and as well as that, today, we're also looking at to see whether that was impacted by actually what that experience was at junior health board as well, because it could be, you know, what was that learner experience, not just in the university, but also to the health board as well. So that's why we want to do that deep dive to really try and capture, you know, what has happened to the last few years. That's very that's yeah, that's, 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 that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Jack, can, can I just make a suggestion um, for yourself and for the executive to consider when we think that these three factors, attrition, filament, placements, are key to our commissioning and therefore spend, that you consider whether we should have a deep time on each of them rather than just the attrition, because that will then enable us to have some firm assurance as to where we are going in our commissioning and what is possible. And it's often you read, you, on the you read it. I'm not the boss, we're a committee here, but you read my um, mind because what I was going to ask, HIW have um, incorporated the train work campaign and um, there should be an element of that which is actually addressing some of these yeah. agendas yeah. Yeah. because, you know, they fit into one another and it would be helpful to also look at the cons department because we've had a number, we've had COVID, but we've also got the NHS career structure and the strikes and all of that and what it's like to work and the pay, all of that kind of stuff. So it would be helpful maybe also in something like a DFM focus to look at the communications agenda within HIW and our relationship with the schools. But that really fits in with the Train Work Live campaign to encourage people into uh, a health service career. Um, with regards to the placements, um, I know that the regulatory bodies are also looking at different levels of clinical experience, which might not just focus on placement, so it might be useful to look at the IT infrastructure as well, with regards to that type of experiential learning, and they're also reviewing the EEC directives, aren't they, in relation to the compulsory set hours for clinical placement, so there may be other innovative ways that we could champion forward to increase um, that agenda. The other thing I was also going to ask is, without getting too operational, is where are we in the business community um, with regards to physios and OTs in relation to leisure centres and health centres and the local government agenda as placements, thinking outside the health service box. So I just wonder, in relation to your comment on a deep dive, whether it is something we could have um, maybe at the next staff conference rather than <coughs> just us looking at it and see whether you as the executive team could look at how we might listen to innovative ways for the full picture, maybe take a helicopter view of 
forward the pillars that actually deliver on this agenda. So we could have gone on more. So we could take that back to the in terms of placement, I think to number one to key as a key objective to move our going forward to this year in that matrix capacity. And I think it's what we want to do is to there's a there's a huge piece of work on placement. So what we can do is actually bring actually what we're currently doing. And then actually obviously the energy cost the energy thing because the um, enhanced energy for uh, simulation actually is quite a controversial issue yes, it is. at the moment <laughs> across into the UK. So it, let's not bite the elephant. Now <laughs> just let's actually sort of say let's do this piece first. Well, let's bite it and produce it. the banana. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, so, so basically what I'd say is let's understand actually what we're currently doing because there's an extensive amount of work that you've been understand that actually then give you some of that detail. And then as you say, there is actually that element that you have that um, you know, sort of actually the regulation and yes, it's quite interesting what's coming through at the moment actually on that. But obviously actually as far as fill rates, hopefully that next paper that's come actually here today as well will start to give you actually the indications of what we're doing. And train work live, dare I say, is already on board with us in that next arena, Martin. So, so one of the things I was I was going to say is there's there's application rates, there's fill rates, yes. there's attrition, there's placements, and there's getting jobs at the end. Mm -hmm. There's these five things. Now, what we could potentially do is produce a matrix with all of our professions that we commissioned on the side, and those five areas across the top and rate them red, green, and amber. Because for some professions, I can tell you, know, everything's green. Yeah, right? yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no shortage of applicants. Fill rates are really good. Uh, no placement issues. Attrition's really low. They all get jobs again. Yeah. And and then for so there's not one size fits all. For different professions, the issue is the number of applicants. Yeah. For another one, it might be attrition for some reason. For the other one, it might be jobs coming up the end. So we can actually provide that picture in a, in a, in a yeah, nice picture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That would be helpful. And when you say you've got green for all professions, I don't know what it is that are the drivers to enable that process. I would just like to add something to, to what my colleagues have um, said. Um, when I brought um, the paper to the board, full board in January about how we transport IMGs by putting um, uh, resourcing at the front end is something exactly when, when it was reported in sex, Lisa did spot that this has applications across all professions. And it's something that I know is uh, integrated into, into the process that you're looking at, because that's one of the things that would, would provide um, an equitable approach. Like doing medicine for other areas as well. That's that's uh, something that's also in the picture, isn't it? Just a quick comment um, on the, the where this is going next, and it's just uh, well, I think we're you know, not not all placements offer the same opportunity. So you can go wrong, you can have absolutely urban, you can have um, you know urban and and all sorts of other sort of not specialists but particular interests. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to know that maybe you can develop some things. I was thinking about North Wales and it's having an older population and lots of rural and that would offer a different experience. Yeah. Um, and we're also engaging actually with social therapy because yes. they are interested in effectively, you know, if I have like a conversation this week about therapists, so they need occupational therapists, we need to train them for them, but it's how we actually can work with them because if they can offer placements as well, actually that's the arena. That we need to get into. So there's masses of opportunities. And it's fair to say we've actually got, we started to develop the matrix of where all those places are now. And it would, it would give potential, it would be potentially attractive both to those of, who could offer opportunities and to those who are looking for them. Yeah. Yeah, just quite now, I don't want to prolong it, Chair. Um, one of my questions was about social care. So yeah. <laughs> So well done, Lisa. I'll have to take that one. <laughs> um, second question really is about the relationship with the university, mm -hmm. which, um, if I could correct me, seems to be improving um, mm -hmm. with dialogue and regular meetings. But I know we've seen papers previously where we haven't got um, data very quickly on mm -hmm. what's happened. 
improving with the students and I just wonder is that improving as well and is it improving all universities so I know we're in a public meeting so we don't necessarily know to so what's just what's described at the end of the paper is actually how we actually listen to the student voice and one of the things that we're quite mindful of doing actually as you can imagine actually like at your health board at your university is quite busy as well and it's how can you work in partnership and the one actually that comes to mind is Hefkin. so basically rather than us having a separate improvement there's nothing worse than having you know separate improvement plans for separate bodies which actually say similar things yeah. so that's actually one of the initiatives that you were doing is actually where we've got those student surveys that is actually public and have to look at that, actually, we look at that, we capture it actually, in a probably more um, qualitative way. So that's the national student schools which you come in actually, nationally. But as well as that, there is the conversation. I think actually, it's an area, and Martin will expand on this, which I think is so qualitative, is where, where the contract meetings happen, there are separate meetings with students. So no, no sort of university people yeah. in that room. So they can be actually very candid, very actually honest <laughs> conversations. And that's where we pick things up. And that's actually where University of South Wales came up. And that's where Bangalore's come up. Um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so, so we've got a range of metrics maybe. Some of the attrition, some of it through the KPIs returns, mm -hmm. some of it through the NSS, and some of it there. And then what we do is we have separate meetings with students, and then separate meetings with practice assessors, um, and perhaps that's just something there's and then separate meetings with the academic heads within the universities and, and we challenge against some of the key themes and concerns um, and then we use that as part of our qualitative metrics to feed back to the universities to inform because a university might we might identify something in the NSS and the university sent us that to a and say we do an ABC and we're going to run these lunch, lunchtime sessions. Mm. And then we'll say to the students, so are these lunchtime sessions working for you? And they may say, what yeah. lunchtime sessions? So then so then all of a sudden we've got the triangulate in all of yeah. that investment. Mm. Okay. Okay, so Lisa, thank you very much for the report. There's a lot of information there and some real positive developments. So well done to the team, um, especially around the maternity and the gun tap agenda. And thank you. So um, really, really good. The um, issues about going, sorry, yes, the issues about going forward are that we'd like to see a lot more information, I think, on how the joined up thinking between the training work the campaign and the comms and um, how we live through the universities and maybe looking at that in greater detail. So it'd be great if the executive could come forward with a plan how we might um, get assurance that everything within our capability is doing to enhance recruitment and retention. I think it would also be helpful to um, maybe on an annual basis, look at the attrition rates for Wales against the full country perspective. So that we get an idea of just where university and the training elements, I know we get it periodically, but to have it on a regular item to demonstrate just where Wales is in relation to some of the attrition rates, because I know they can be quite high in other parts of the UK and we to see what... <laughs> We, we will strive to do that and when we and when we do produce our attrition rates where we can benchmark and put indicators we will um since he stopped centrally commissioning a lot of programs um because they used to publish their annual attrition rates in all yeah. the reports it's harder to get some of that stuff out of england so we will do it where we can but we might have to caveat it a little bit as well but where we match quite close is in Scotland and Northern Ireland yeah. and the issue with regard to the bursary as well yeah. you know so all of those kind of things so yeah. we've got some commonalities in there but it just gives us a template upon which we can see exactly where Wales is in relation to the things and what we might do differently and all actually congratulate them doing well because yeah. it's not all a bad picture yeah. okay so um the members are asked to note 
the um, quality developments identified risks and exceptions in relation to nursing health professional education and um, we've also asked for um, a template now of how we might look at a little bit more appropriate using John's word a deep dive into some of those areas that we might give us better assurance as an organization. Can I have one point for FC? So just to let them um, and this is part of the initiatives as well. So just to sort of as a quality development development, we ran a very successful healthcare science conference at G and that it was an all wheels run we ran, ran that G week last Monday. Alina Morganity, the um, health minister, came face to face and gave that presentation. It was absolutely incredible. And when you think of the number of healthcare scientists that uh, there are, I mean, that room was absolutely full. Um, in terms of allied health professionals, rather than actually running a conference this year, what they've decided to do with you, we've just completed the second one, which is the day before yesterday, um, is workshops across Wales. So they've done one at you in North Wales, they've done a second one at you here. And there's a third one to be done that you've done in the southwest as well. So that's about to really take in two or two arenas all the opportunities that are there. And in terms of nursing, then actually there are two nursing conferences planned this year um, on the back of the nursing work as well. Thanks. I did see some of that on social media. Did it go over two days or something? Yeah, it was a really good conference. And well, it was one day. That one oh, oh, has yeah. two days. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, right. Thank you. So we're moving on to part three now, strategic matters, um, paper three point one, and um, over to you again, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. So as I described to you previously, um, underneath we've the got Zoom. Sorry, we've got Zoom up here. Is there? Okay. Um, and obviously, underneath this infrastructure, we have a strategic review of education university that is a program board. And what we do bring to you, which is the highlight report, um, the current one that you, as a result of the, of the latest to do board has happened. This describes to you all the initiatives that's been taken forward in probably what I would call is actually the post registration arena. Um, healthcare support workers are actually are in there as well, but it just describes to you where we are in actually implementing and developing and actually targeting when those first learners are actually going to access some of these courses. So it's a summary of the phase two projects. Um, and there you can see actually where they are, where some are actually on Amber. And then as a result of that, then um, it actually really actually sort of, um, describes to you the processes that are coming actually through to this committee and through to the board for actually developments of new contracts, new tenders um, and awards as well. So, Happy to take to you any questions from this. Lisa, before yeah. I follow the questions, can I just say that two of the amber ones, because this is quite far to win. Yes. Since we actually submitted the paper, the decreased <coughs> camps and CBT is now green. That's completely on track. But I pretend that we are answering clarification questions, but that's closing soon. And also, um, the distance learning or time tender is now. Green as well, because I've been meeting with John Day, social care workers, to sort out the incorporation of social care elements as well. So those two were on the when the paper came, but this week they both go green. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Jill? Yeah, I, and it's more of a reminder, and uh, thanks for all the work that's going on in this, by the way. And uh, I mean, it's a huge, huge. Um, diverse programs, so I should say that up front. Um, the bit I forgot is how we decide on the categories that we are going out to tender on and what drives that. And I forgot how we got to those. Yes, sir. So, so a lot of this are things that we are already doing. But we're already doing them and the contracts are expiring, or there hasn't been a contract around it, and we're wrapping a contract around it. However, it's not a reprocurement as such, just reprocurement the same thing. We are taking that opportunity to do wide stakeholder engagement and make sure it's fit for purpose for the 21st century. It's much disciplined where appropriate. The training is proportionate, that it's all Wales in the recurrent need. 
and then and then that's how we're doing it. So a lot of this has been existing things, and then some of it has been in response to service need. So for example, that of critical care modules that we've developed has been in response to COVID and the need to um, improve and standardize those, those skills in those areas. And through the psychological therapies and the mental health work, caps the clinical sources of like psychology's branding. And the way that we deliver something education has been modernized as well. The clinical photography model just wasn't working with the current university, so we're now introducing a world based learning model. However, can I just talk very so? But we're well aware, but what we're aware of is that these are all the things we're already doing. And what's concerning me is the SRO are uh, what are we not doing? What are we, where are we missing the opportunities? So, so what we what we talked about in the um, in the project board, which is uh, chairs that I'm the SRO for, I presented a paper earlier in the week, uh, which is going to execs on the fifth around late in June having a stakeholder event where in the morning we celebrate the success of what we're doing and we want to get some learners there doing short presentations as well around advanced practice or critical care or whatever to talk about how the education has impacted on them as individual the skills how they do their role their confidence and the impact on the wider multidisciplinary team or the patient pathway or the safety and quality of patient care which would be quite inspirational and then in the afternoon we're going to have a focus on the national programs and some of the key deliverables in the national programs. Some of the challenges then around nursing that we know around from the RCN um, nursing numbers report and other things around two point five nurses or, 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 or different things there. A focus on the HPs, a focus on healthcare sciences, then linking it in with the national programs and then going into focus groups, um, to specific focus groups to see actually what should we be doing what could make an impact um, how will it make an impact how can we evaluate it sort of thing and then from that we're going to generate new ideas and things that will make a difference in Wales so that's a really important conference Jill. sorry i hope that helps answer your question yes, I, know. I think that's what was going through my mind because we don't remember seeing the look to the future bit so, mm. and, and it might not you know because i've come into it probably half weeks mm -hmm. through my I thought maybe I missed that. But, um, I mean, as an example, I really feel like in much particular one, there is one program that we're looking at at the moment. And I think as a health education improvement is a rec is recognised as, you know, at the strategic education that is in authority. So I think for this week, we've had one sort of um, not always national group, professional group, come to us to do, and shared with us to the anxieties they have about a specific program. And as a result of that, they do want to approach us now. We listen and we actually explore it. And that's something that Martin and I are doing absolutely now, so that the program that actually is commissioned does recognize what they're saying. And actually, all our programs actually, we are future proofing. In other words, saying that you're okay, we can't be absolutely crystal ball for grading, but are we too sure this is what the service needs? There's a lot of engagement with service end. Definitely. John? Yeah. Thank you, Chef. I think you partly answered my first question, Martin, which was around a little bit of context to 6.12, which is the project group looking to explore inclusion in social care in the procure, the implications regarding the authority to procure, etc. etc. And I've just wondered. How is that working vis a vis social care and our role, etc.? It's gone green, so I presume it, everything's been sorted. Yeah, so. Are you speaking to social yeah. care? Yeah, yeah. So, so first, it's saying that it's really good to have um, Shona sitting in here. She's going to help us with a well strategy placement for us. And Shona is a senior um, project officer working with us on um, phase two, amongst other things as well. So it's really nice for Sean to hear some of this conversation. John, in answer to your question, I think um, I think we had to sort of work hard with social care to ascertain the need and the vacancies and the opportunities for staff there and look at the release from some of their day job to study, if you like, part-time part um, around, around this. 
we've now bottomed it out. We were worried about different funding streams um, and maybe some subcontracts with local authorities and various things and, and where the funding is coming from. We, we bottomed all of that out and now we'll be in the paper. So what we've agreed when we've looked at the proportion of nurses in the NHS, the proportion of nurses in, in social care and the vacancies and the impact, what we've agreed currently is to add 20 to 30 percent on to our commissioned NHS numbers for social care to manage that through. And, um, and Liz Hargess, who some of you may know, is retiring, but she's going to stay on with us one and a half days a week for, for nine months. And part of her remit will to be work, work across social care to integrate this into what we're doing. So we've got some really good solutions. And, and, and that's exactly back to the conversation I had earlier about occupational health and well. We just wanted to understand what those funding streams and that potential, because currently our education and training plan is actually commissioned as a result of the actually um, uh, IMTPs actually from health boards. Well, how do we capture what local authority needs are? Because that will enrich actually that experience for that learner if we can actually integrate them as a resource we have to. So, so yeah. in terms of the new requirement for care home workers to be registered, presumably there are that's an untapped resource also for this particular area. Yeah, but they want to keep their staff, they want to want to manage their staff. No, but to <laughs> well, actually to enhance the knowledge, oh, skills yes. and attributes within yes. that because because they they take from the NHS. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But actually to see the cost benefit of working across those organisations and meeting their registration requirements. It's, it's huge. And, right. this is, and this is what our care home education facilitators are doing. They really work to embed that educational infrastructure across initially the bigger nursing homes so that, so that the staff working there can have opportunities not just at sort of register level but post reg level and also support works as well. This is poor works that they got because they're yeah. the new ones being registered last October. So in relation to that, it's an untapped group it is. of individuals which actually are still need and, and contribute to the overall. Yeah. There's, there's, there's yeah. a lot of work to be done there. And I think that's to where, as, as Mark said, the care home education facilities have got a wealth of knowledge. And I think you know, that's the quality. It's, 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 it's imminent. It's imminent, isn't it? Actually, about what they actually found out to actually help them in the rest. That's all it's all. John and then Rick. <coughs> uh, I just my question about the issue with the to say. Can I ask, um, secondly, then, with regards to R23, um, the, the RAG rating is red, but the trend is going down and green. So I wonder if you could just give us some context as to gain this assurance. Um, where are we on that? R23 is the answer, so long, it's, um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You want to go? Well, that's and, and, and um, Lisa might want to come in. We, we, we're, we're, having, we're having some 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 ongoing dialogue at the moment um, with the National Imaging Academy around the role that they are going to uh, play in some of this training, which we want to deliver from there, particularly the simulation, and we want it to be done multi professionally. Um, at the moment, we're still in discussion with them around structures and how will that look, which is potentially delaying um, our vision of what, we, of what we want. So we are currently um, working with UWE. So that would be interesting. We're currently working with UWE to extend that contract with them, but then actually get them working tripartite with us and with the National Imaging Academy to start to scope some of that interaction. And it was actually so nearly they've been to the Imaging Academy themselves and actually struggled actually to recruit sonography educators. So obviously it's actually trying to help them to actually sort of um, uh, recruit to, to those. But once again, actually what we are looking at is our current NHS workforce in Wales and how can we actually sort of have that arrangement between a G who currently delivers and it could be the new G developer placement of the opportunities of doing as well. So what is the okay. Okay. Yes. okay. 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 This is really helpful. Oh, this is really very straightforward. Thank you very much. I'm just reflecting that when we um, started on 
um, strategic review phase two. Um, I don't think any of us envisage the Dick Corona. I can't see the Dick Corona. It's just an autocracy ban. Um, it's also done something very useful, I think, which is to give some simple words uh, yes. as were perceived, um, there's some idea of maybe a party dress. And so, yeah, um, I think it's, uh, it's been quite a lot of going. My question is uh, are we still on track for the overall program? Have we got the resources to support this expansion? Um, and it's um, very much going to continue to do that. It's got that nature. Yeah, so we actually do receive a report at year eight, and um, there's a roadmap that we've got to do, which shows that you well every day to do the stage of the doing. Didn't actually share that. It's a really good roadmap, so it's sure it's fantastic. Um, but you're right, Titi. I think actually that is one question that we ask at year every at year, um, every one of the programmes, and it's about who takes it forward. I mean, if I give you an example, Titi, that mental health is now actually developing some of their initiatives. But actually, what we want to do is actually bring the other people actually across health division and what we're seeing to be the lead to on certain programmes. So I know as well, Margaret has come to the shelter with prescribing. So it's about actually how that's taken forward so that we have, a, because we've got a good um, mechanism of tendering and procurement, you know, why actually destabilise that? But we're actually very mindful of that resource so we'll do that, I think that's really good. I think some of the other things that we've had also very valuable. Thank you. Um, I think this is a, a really good report we to because it's top level and it gives a lot of information. Uh, we're the committee on this year. Yeah. So well done on that. Um, and these are the reports that you've with the new city and each one of our former boards. Yeah. Well, more of the same yeah, in yeah. terms of that kind of agenda because it, it saves an awful lot of yeah. deep down questions that come across. So well Thank done you. on that. Um, the paper does say executive team is asked to note. I presume it's the committee is asked to note this report. Yeah. So um, hopefully um, it went to the execs and they noted it. We noted it. So um, this is the transparency of it to to help me to how that governance works. Okay. The other thing I was going to suggest is um, you've mentioned how you can take this out. I think some of this positivity we could see whether or not the execs would be keen to put this into the NHS compared to conference so that you can put something out about how this is delivering, um, get some positive news out and encourage people to um, see exactly what you're achieving in, in what was a huge consultation process, because this is really delivering on what we had um, hoped to deliver. So if we could get it out in some of the conferences um, so other people understand exactly what has been delivered, it would be helpful. Okay, um, right, time, uh, we are quite a bit over um, time running, but over to 3.2, plan to achieve nursing commission numbers. You again, Lisa? Yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm going to bring Martin in here because she obviously, as we've mentioned earlier, um, obviously we have got challenges in that recruitment to other programmes. And as I heard previously, it's not about just accepting this. It basically, we have now de identified the number of initiatives that we're now taking forward in order to address that you not only to the um, access to courses, but actually the, the information before you access the courses. It's also about the preparation of the individual before they access the courses, but also actually what other initiatives we are developing. And actually, it's fair to say here this is actually a collaboration, actually, as Martin highlighted earlier. Universities do a lot of work here, and we need that information and intelligence and support. But it's nevertheless how can we enhance that recruitment to in into the NHS way? So, okay, I've just got to do just two minutes. Yeah, um, but 21 22 saw the rest of the <coughs> city at one level of fund. Applications out here went through the roof. Um, Nurses were, you know, heroes, and it was all over the news. An application to nursing across the UK went up. 22 23, perhaps some of that narrative across the UK has changed a little bit, and we saw a big decline across the UK. Not quite so big in Wales as in England, but we saw a decline in applications to nursing courses across the UK. That's affected the number of quality applicants that can be able to recruit. 
to this year, and we're still at the end of that recruitment cycle because we're still in March. We're thinking it's going to be about 1,870 to 1,900. We will bring the exact number to the that. So it's, it's gone down, which went from 1,995 to 1,900 doesn't seem a lot. But actually, our aspiration because of the needs have gone up from 2,100, which is 1,995 is against, to 2,396. So we've got a bigger gap. So the fill rate will probably go from about 91% to about 80%. Um, even though the fill place has only, has only dropped by three, five, about five percent, this course has a big problem. We know this for the for the um, drops in applications across the UK. So we've done deep dives with the universities when, when we noticed this back sort of in the summer, and we've put together an action plan because before we knew this, before this became apparent, we submitted our education training plan to our government. And we want to trade 2,701. So we've got a big gap between the 2,701 and the 9,000. So we've come up with a lot of innovative ways to try to address that gap. One of them is we're starting some international student nursing cohorts. Um, that will be about 150. It's going to be proportionate, but it's going to have a lot of value. Um, the CNO is very keen on that, and we're waiting for final sign up for that. But at the moment, before we take it to exam, that's a great support. Um, then we're looking at um, a, a file note to do a part-time distance learning course with the OU, which is we then going to be going out to tender for a part-time distance learning program in the future, and that will bring in about an extra 100 to 130. And um, we've, in, we've embedded our um, we've embedded our level four support worker contracts. We've awarded them, and we are going to quadruple the number of that. And that's based on what the members of health will say they want to go through on their account basis. And the other thing that Liz, our guest, has stayed on with is to make sure when those four programs get established and accredited on time, the new programs, and that the health boards and social care are releasing the right students with the right skills and we put the right support mechanisms around them so that they get on the program and start the program and graduate. And then we want, we can set an ambitious target of about 67% of those to assimilate straight to year two of nursing programs, full of part time, because we've mapped this new provision against the level four year one of the programs. We are also developing um, a HSW role in clearing by doing signposting to other universities for different things. But more than that, the students that apply and are offered places with universities have been through an interview process, not only with the university, but with health board staff. And these are students that are deemed to have the right values of the makers. So if they fail academically, actually, they still have got a desire to care. And therefore, we are looking at our role for HF, and I met Angie Oliver last night on this, and we're looking for a role um, for HIW in streamlining some of those applicants that fail academically into full-time or part-time support worker roles and building a bundle of bespoke level three education for them to do and then so that they can do that part-time to develop taster days with the universities um, so that they can become they can join courses six months later or one year later and they're not just lost to health because at the moment a university and i'm generalizing here <laughs> a university will try to get a student on a program if they don't make the grade they'll try to get into any other program in the university and if they can't if they don't they lose touch with them but we want to wrap our arms around them acknowledge their care in nature and nurture them into roles and we are thinking that there's going to be at least 20 for each university that we will be able to do that with. Martin, I think time is going on okay. because that's in the paper. Oh, it's not in the paper. So um, is there any... No, there's, a, there's, there's just a raft of initiatives we're doing to try to give you assurance okay. that we are trying to get to 271. Okay. Any questions from anybody? Right, John. Quick. Yes. Quick. So, okay. <laughs> So um, my first question relates to the international recruitment program. Um, uh, I, I've got no problem with it. I'm just conscious 
that that may have implications of destabilizing the wider the wider um, context of placements of, uh, of of commissioning and also of current arrangements that are in place within universities there are a number that currently recruit international students that have financial implications for health boards and <laughs> universities um, and it's a financial gain for health boards it's a financial gain for universities there's the potential here if we don't consider it of destabilizing the national picture don't need an answer now chair if that can be considered then we manage it um, similarly the ld initiative i think it's a good initiative but again we are taking 20 four out of one pot and putting it into another pot. We're not increasing the overall, we're just trying to move the deck chairs around, so to speak. So I think that's um, the other thing then is, um, you know, I applaud the team on the initiatives. I have to say that this paper was a pleasure to read in terms of the extent to which you were looking at ways to try and maximize how we recruit people across the, the whole of the career framework. So I, I should have said that right from the start. My challenge, therefore, would be have you considered graduate entry visit? We see a lot of it at the moment, certainly social media, certainly, so certainly coming across by phone, 18 months in such and such a university, and you can be a qualified nurse, etc. Again, all the challenges. Is that possible for us as part of our commissioning? Um, that's what I'm thinking about doing today, Chair. Okay, we have to use your mobile and the ATS. I your point, Tian. Were you pleased that you this week that you have the Creative Team to work with the Royal College of Nursing? And our first that you learned disability consultant, nursing consultant, that you in Wales, in order to try and have that in different ways as well. <laughs> I think to take from that an excellent paper, some really, really good initiatives. Please send that back to the team. Um, there's real assurance there. One thing I would like a little bit more development on is the ethical recruitment agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So it kicks in, linking in with the CNO requirements. Um, I know you meant CNO Wales, but CNO England is charged yeah. with looking at that. So that comes in there. And um, I know that um, the previous Health Minister of Wales also looked at the Ghana agenda. Um, there was funding available to that. That's not mentioned in the paper, so it'd be useful to see where Royal College is linked in with that, because that is an ongoing funding program. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the members are asked to know this report um given those very very positive um, comments okay. okay lisa planning approach for the education and training plan 2024-25 so as you know Andy, we have to sort of revise statutory responsibility to develop a and education training strategy every year um, and obviously push it to the and i actually do this together um, and actually, as you know, we actually had a, a very different approach last year, where we had just initiated actually through the strategic reference group um, and engaged actually a wider audience in order to describe that. And dare I say, actually, we've had a meeting this morning actually to further our sort of plan actually for 24-25, um, learning the lessons of actually previous, um, but also looking now to that we're currently about to embark upon 23-24 implementation, but we need to learn the lessons and understand what we've achieved through 22-23. So this is just giving you the overview of actually how we are taking this forward um, alongside the plan. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, well, I've slowed the planned approach for the development. Are there any mm -hmm. comments or questions? Like Jill, thank you. Be really quick. <laughs> um, yeah, just a very quick one. Um, first of all, why you widen the group, which I can see um, in terms of. Um, and I know this might be a 
is that question the where's finer finer is in brackets apparently they're not in there do you so rebecca um uh, so Rihanna and Rihanna do in there i think you're right it's the okay and i'll miss energy there but um <laughs> so i can assure you to be on honesty and she's on the um, um, mentioned shared services and the um, level of information that they ought to hold or should hold for the whole of the NHS in Wales. So I just wanted to have that with the impact again and back to the links with social care again and how that feeds into I know the education and training plan is for HRW but there wasn't really much mention of any of the features so so the start of the process study is um the way to share this study with our stakeholder reference group and of course as you know to that stakeholder reference group has got broad membership yeah including actually social yeah. care but as as I described to you earlier um, the conversation I'm having actually with, with key people is actually how they can inform and influence actually, into the arena as well. So it's an opportune time, so they are here on our shoulders. Okay, so we've been asked to note the planned approach for the development and is providing this further development of the paper with regard to finance and social care going forward. Then, um, Okay, thank you. Thank you for your speedy catch up in the time on that. <laughs> Everybody. Right, um, moving on to part five, five foot one. I've got about 40 minutes to give this report now. So I like <laughs> um, just to say that um, as a chair, I attend the stakeholder reference group. The last meeting was held on the 9th of February. Um, there were a number of presentations. Um, with regard to uh, informing the future workforce in the critical care services, I thought it was very positively received by quite a wide um, ranging group, um, extremely positive, whether it was from the commissions or um, different professional groups. And the strategic workforce plan for pharmacy, um, again, that went down really, really well. There was quite a lot of detail in that, but um, again, very positive. And the approach to the development of the education and training plan 24 25. Um, there were slides, and you agreed to share those slides. Um, which you have, I was just about to say, which you have done. I can see them there. Um, but there's a lot of information on those. And an overdrew, overdrew, overview of the draft INTP. Um, the next meeting is on Tuesday, the 9th of May. I will say that. It really is an eye opener attending that group because there's a lot of positivity about the work and the relationships that go on between HIW and the different professional groups and stakeholders at whatever level. So it's a very meaningful um, meeting. And you know, when you're sitting there thinking, oh, I wish that question was asked, somebody asked it, you know, and you get that information. So very, very good way of um, ensuring our communication processes are working across the sector. Um, contributes to the work that we do. So, yeah, very, very positive. Um, I'm not required to give any other information um, on that because the minutes and or, or the notes and the outcome are shared. So, um, but I'll take any questions if there are any. Nope. Sorry. Okay. It was very positive. Yeah. And now we're moving on to um, how are we for time? Are we caught up? Yes, yeah, so you need more confidence well, I think, well, in the team. Yeah. No, well <laughs> done, team. team. <laughs> Welsh language showcase placement videos. This is going to be a real yeah. huge um, success, I think. I yeah. can't wait to see them. So, no, so it's really, they're quite inspirational, some of them. And the idea behind this is we wanted students to talk about their experiences of using Welsh language and tongue placement, the impact that has on them and has on the patient. And the reason is, is that we want to encourage other students to use Welsh for placement, even if they speak a little bit or if they're fluent. Um, 
So we've got permission from all the universities to use these videos. We've got to put a few subtitles on sound and a little bit of branding, but they're almost there, which you will see. And um, we've got permission for the students to use it nationally. We're going to put it on our website, and then in April and May, we'll link them with comms, and we're going to release a couple a week. Um, and actually, these can be used in schools as well, so that because there might be school children thinking, I want a career where actually I can use my Welsh. And if they can see some of this, it's really good. So, so Shona um, is hopefully going to just run some of these. We've got nine videos, they're really short. Um, and if we haven't got enough time for them, there's just a few I would like to show you. No, we need some time. Okay, we're good for time. Okay, <laughs> so thank you, Shona. Hello, for Enuio Thomas Lewis, Avi and Dusky and Pri the Skull Abertawe, Avi and Yaith Gintav Kamrag. Hello, my name is Thomas Lewis. I am a third year paramedic student in Swansea University uh, and I am a first language Welsh student. Here the if you mean about Charadam, Pam Macamrag and Boyseg, Pam Hin Mas are placement. Uh, we would about our placement uh, Dros Camry, so right land e canarvon Bangor Arrel, a right loud e reader man a Abertawe. Um, I'm going to be talking about why Welsh is so important when out on placement. I've been out on placement all over Wales. I've been right up to Carnarvon, Bangor and Rill, right down to places like Armenford and Swansea. Uh, Vijana Cymraeg pob dydd pam fi'n mas ar placement, wel fi'n trial i anyway. Um, os mae mentos i'n siarad Cymraeg, fi'n siarad Cymraeg i nhw. Os mae patients i'n siarad Cymraeg, fi'n siarad Cymraeg i nhw. Um, rai weithiau fi'n siarad Cymraeg am tymi bach o, o parll um, i'r patients i. Um, so I try and speak Welsh every single day when out on placement. Um, if my mentors speak Welsh, I speak Welsh to them. Uh, if my patients speak Welsh, I speak Welsh to them. Uh, a lot of the time, especially in older people, I try and speak Welsh to the patients uh, as a sign of respect to them. Um, a beth fi'n ffindio pan fi'n mas ar placement, ond gyda'r patients sy'n reilu yn sâl, um, mae siarad Cymraeg i'n nhw gallu helpu. So what I tend to find is out on placement, if I'm with a really unwell patient, um, what I tend to find is if I speak Welsh to them, um, it kind, they kind of react a little bit better. Um, some studies have suggested that if patients are really unwell, they want to be spoken to in their, in their mother tongue or in the language they used to speak as children. Uh, and what you tend to find is people are a lot more responsive then. Um, so this is why I think Welsh language is really important uh, out on placement, we really and made all my camrag and boys say he and last lana placement. Uh, Dear Convert Pub, thank you everyone. Yeah, Well, what we've done as well, I'm just by the while asking about this, we've got it from a range of universities and we've got it across a range of professions. And, and uh, Thomas was fairly fluent. And when they submitted that Swansea, they said, Do you want him to be a little bit more sneaky in his delivery? And I thought, That's absolutely perfect because that's what he talks. Yeah. That's how people want to relate to. So, yeah. thank you. My name is Debbie Parsons and I'm a second year Adelaide student. I went to Ysgol Gynradd uh, Mevyn James and I went to Ysgol Gyfrin Gartholog, both of which are Welsh medium schools. And I've spoken Welsh in the house with my family, but with, especially with the younger children that all go to Welsh schools. I've had multiple opportunities to speak Welsh with my friend in the university. Um, most of the time we speak Welsh to try and gain a bit more confidence in our Welsh speaking abilities. I recommend anyone who can't speak Welsh to speak Welsh, especially with the patients. Um, even if you aren't fluent, even if it's just basic Welsh, the patients really appreciate it. I've had multiple opportunities to converse in Welsh with the patients. Um, most of the time it's with dementia patients because um, most of the time they tend to um, forget their second language, which is English, and they go back to their first language, which is Welsh. 
and once you speak to them you can see them light up with happiness because they sort of remember when they were younger, speak well to their families and just, the conversation just feels a bit more natural. I feel it's important to speak Welsh if you can. Um, I feel it's beneficial to the staff, patients and myself and it also opens up more job opportunities. So when we go without, we can show the Welsh and we can show the English as well. So the same as this thing. So if you could come to the forefront, which is Banya, so this is a bilingual video and it's a range of students that should be taken. I've also got these different qualities as well. So the quality I've done quite low for today because um because of the bad when I you've got sort of you know, it comes to hospital, the environment is so chaotic, it's so stressful, you have people running around. So going from your home into somewhere unfamiliar can be really scary. And I think just hearing that little bit of Welsh or having someone speak Welsh to you you kind of feel like home has come to hospital. You're, it, you know, you can listen to people speaking Welsh and it's like being at home where, you know, your family would speak Welsh to you and it would just make you feel more at ease, I think. So safe and effective care and communication go hand in hand. So making sure that we are communicating with the patient's um, language choice is really important in terms of their safety as well as their satisfaction. Fel claf a roedd wedi bod yn ofnadwy o ddistaw um, neu bod yn gallu cyfathrebu fo hi a dim cael dimlad o wybodaeth o, o rwsi hi a dwi maen nhw'n gofyn sy'n ni'n siarad y Cymraeg um, a rwsi'n bod o'n fy mod i lle ar gofyn sy'n fi i, i trio siarad efo hi e gweld sy'n ni'n cael ei fath o wybodaeth allan yn hynny. A mi'n nath o weithio, mi'n nath i ddechrau um, siarad efo ni um, a gweld un o'r dogdoniad yn hollol um, siac a chawsod nhw'n droed i chodi llais i o blaen. Um, ond, ja, yeah, nath i ddechrau siarad a son a mi symptoma a be oedd yn bod y gallu. Um, so mae yna'n enghraifft um, y gwych o... Yes, but I had to read English without the others. I could understand the Welsh. Welsh, I could. So that one was when they were speaking in English, they read the other Welsh at night, or the vice versa. So it's quite nice. And I've been informed that we can break it up into nice bite sized chunks. But um, but she went on to tell the story about how the patient really reacted to her and that the doctors were amazed because they couldn't get anything out of the patient before and they were opening up and telling mm -hmm. her things about, about her condition that, that they just weren't getting, which was a really nice story. Um, we can send this around help. So have you got the event or not? Um, <laughs> so, do you want to try the bank one again, or shall I try the No, no, no. No, no. no. Um, we've, 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 it goes either 4A or 4B, and then we've got. Uh, so, we've got one which is 40 seconds, and then we've got a number of which are short ones. So, we want you to get the gist of it. You'll do a really good company, good for schools, good for colleges, good for social media. The students, I think, generally. We'll try four eyes, and that will work best. Dwi'n teimlo'n hynod yn falch fy mod i'n gallu cynnig gwasanaeth bydragedd i mynywod a'u teulu oedd um, yn ystod cyfnod bwysig iawn o bywydau yn trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg. O brofiad, um, mae a teulu oedd si wedi derbyn uh, gwasanaeth trwy gyfrwng y Gymraeg wedi sôn bod hwn wedi cael effet positif iawn um, ar eu profiad. A mae fe hefyd wedi dangos um, bod perthnasau yn gallu cael eu adeilad i'n gyflym rhwng fy niau teulio trwy defnyddio Cymraeg fel ei iaith gyntaf a derbyn gwasanaeth yn ei iaith gyntaf sy'n mor positif. 
So we've got that with English as well, with Welsh subtitles, and we've got our logo on top of that. So do you, Lisa, do you want to put this on the spot now? Do you want to just give a summary of what she said? But... Oh, no, it's that one. She was at ERT, and I think it's just who did right. it. Who did it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want to look at the Cardiff one now? Yeah, yeah, any of the Cardiff ones, just to sort of give a little flavour. Oh, she's left this one. <laughs> Hello, Catherine Unenui, Dwi'n Fyfyrio Nersio, um, Rysgo Cyrdydd, ac fi wedi dwi'n ddio'r Gymraeg yn eitha amal ar leoliad. Um, un claf, fi'n cofio, oedd hi ddim yn cyfathrebu, doedd hi ddim yn siarad, achos oedd hi wedi mensio eitha um, gwael. Ond mi oedd hi'n siarad Gymraeg, oedd hi'n nyddiadau hi, ac oedd hi'n gweud cwpl o eiriau fan hyn fan draw. So, when I was in the house, 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 I thought that was lovely because, I mean, basically she didn't speak at all and then she started singing to that and that she, she started singing Karen Lan and that she then, she didn't have any reaction first of all, but then when she went back, she did it for you, uh, the, the patient that she started to hum Karen Lan back to us, so she got through to us. Yeah. Sharing, talk, talk, sharing more? I think, if you want to see a couple more, you can, but yeah, see Where are people? Um, Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, the Cardiff ones are quiet, just to, just so you're We also encourage them to record them with if they could on their own phones. Because when you look at TikTok, when you look Hello, at... Hello, I'm going to be Lisa, I've been studying your physiotherapy in previous school, Cardiff. And I see the movie of Yvonne Cymraeg at a club. How many masks are you using to cover them? So I've been at the Gwydd, I see masks in Gwydd Club, and I've been studying your physiotherapy in previous school, Cardiff. So I think Karim Lan was in Gidar Assessiad to Kumrag, and I just needed to know a lot of life for and I think a lot more material. And how it was in Panathani Lan and Tunyat, and it's like well, but a club got a lot more commercials, and but now lots more kind of engaged got Tunyat for it. I think he was that he's translated that one, but I think that was quite interesting. She was a Cardiff student, and she was went to Kumrag then. Where you know there's a lot of people actually in South West that she's a really yeah, she speaks Russian, but she picked that up. And I think the fact that she had acknowledged and um, it improved and enhanced the way she had accepted the treatment, I think she was the key there. Hiya, any of you, Sally, I do in a studio nurse here, Yachid Madolio, good a free vessel, Kaya Steve. So we only bought a placement on Pez where we can not see him. On the way to Calsal Cavalier, the Nether Gamai, Gera Clavion, and Nurses Alash are awards in Gracia Arno. Mohon would he help you, Maggie Parthenas, Gera Clavion, and Nurses Alash, and would he help you, he that bloody Hudder, and a placement to him? Four weeks in, she was down to her first four weeks, she was just fantastic. The confidence that she's got that she in order to start speaking well, she, not just to patients but to our staff colleagues as well. So, where did you say these are being shared? So, get back to the plan. So, we're going to have it on the comms plan, it'll be going on the website, people will be able to click on them and click on the website. Um, I've met with David Tristan as well. Hello, yeah. yeah. my name is Fiona Target. Yes, thank you, thank you, David. He's really excited about it, come on to share it in his arenas. And we're also going to put it on our um, on our Twitter account and release a couple of weeks and have a theme of Welsh language on Facebook. Yeah, it's going into that. It's going to be the careers now. It's going to put them to see as well. So we're going to use them quite wide once we finish the branding. That's it. This is the last. This is the last one from Cardiff. This lady is. Target and I'm a third year physiotherapy student at Cardiff University. I am a fluent Welsh speaker, however, I don't come from a Welsh speaking household and therefore opportunities to speak Welsh in my local area are quite limited. However, being on clinical placement and being surrounded by Welsh speaking clinical educators as well as patients has given me the opportunity to practice speaking Welsh um, on a daily basis 
and because of that my fluency has improved quite a bit um, and I'm now much more confident in speaking the language and because of that I enjoy speaking it a lot more. So the other one Yeah, we'll leave that on. It's quite, it's quite normal. But, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have not the current members in yet. Okay. And, and, and they will be so the speech speech Yeah, and, and, the, and the rest of the door ones are just about to be sent to me too. And then we're linking in with the University of South Wales media team that's doing the subtitles and the, the bracket press. So yeah, quite excited. Quite excited about the film. So I think there's yeah. some really positive. Yeah. Um, ex experiences there that the students are sharing. It is, especially the impact on mm -hmm. patients. Yeah. I think I think the one that yeah. um, was thinking that what she said to have the impact to her. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what she said. Can't think be she proud to do it as well as the patients. Well, on behalf of the commission, can I thank you for that and um, Shanna for your perspective as well. It would be lovely to see the final package, maybe abroad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good news story yeah. abroad. So if we could yeah. put the whole thing with the um, how you're going to share it and all yeah. that campaign, and it'd be nice to have that sense so we could share on our social media channels. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, right, gone over on time, but. That's really uplifted me. <laughs> All of the things we've discussed, very, very important. There's been some really positive papers today with lots and lots of data that, and I think with an audience in the committee, so well done if you could take that back to your team and we mean that, you know. And um, also um, from our perspective, thank you for trying to keep on time. We've got a couple of extra committee meetings to put in the diary, haven't we? We, we have uh, yeah. so we have got an additional meeting uh, in April the 16th, I believe, that's when it yeah. That's to consider um that's for the mind the, the, the PTP. Yeah, so yeah, so that paper exceeds funding pounds, so therefore it's to be considered by this committee and then to be approved uh, by the board. And that additional board meeting will take place after the board come session is scheduled for April. So, is it possible that could be um, on Teams or rather than present aid? We have to be present aid. The education committee meeting. Yeah. So, on the 16th. So, we either go for, I think the position we either go for a face to face meeting or that we go for a virtual meeting. Not to have a, a, People, are, a as it's an extra meeting, happy to go for virtual? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But I have no items of any other business other than informed that we need an extra meeting. So if people are happy to have that yeah. virtual um, because it's an extra meeting, that'd be great. And our next call meeting here is the 22nd of June. So thank you very much. Right, we're going to close session, are we? Do people need a quick break? <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, I asked to usually to Thank <laughs> you.